So Michaela Berger is the Community Partnership Senior Associate at Girls Who Code, working with schools, library networks, and nonprofits to bring Girls Who Code's free resources and curriculum to students. It's all yours. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you all for being here. I will start sharing my screen. All right, is this visible to folks? Yes. Perfect, I'm getting thumbs up. Awesome, I will start now then. So yes, Hi, hello everyone. everybody. Welcome. In just a few minutes. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. I think that was just an accidental unmute. No worries. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as, as Jonathan introduced, my name is Michaela. I'm a senior associate here at Girls Who Code. Um, I'm so thrilled to be joining you all today to discuss some ways that we can develop holistic and equitable coding programs in your community and how to access free resources that you can bring right back to your students and families. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's session. And as well, uh, in addition, you can see up in that corner, this will come up on a couple slides, so no huge rush, but you are welcome to use that link right there, that bit.ly link, or to scan that QR code. And you can use the code NE23 um, to get a copy of this presentation right from me after we wrap up here. Oh, and the we also shared it in the, the tote bag, so folks already have, have access to the, the slideshow. Perfect. And my email will be displayed a little bit later in the presentation if anybody has any direct questions. So lots of different ways you can get all this information for sure. So we'll take just a quick moment to review what you can expect to learn today. We'll start off with introductions and sharing a little bit about who we are at Girls Who Code and our movement to close the gender gap in tech. Then we'll dive into some strategies for mindfully developing a strengths-based culture centered around connections, care, and empathy before moving on to a discussion on cultivating inclusivity, equity, and diversity into your student programs. Then we'll discuss how you can bring these strategies to your own schools. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end, but feel free to pop some questions into Zoom. Even if I don't see them right away, I will very excitedly answer them once we hit the Q&A time as well. So we can start with the very, very basics. We can take a look at what coding is really. Put it simply, coding is writing commands to instruct a computer to do something in a programming language it can understand. You're simply learning to speak the computer's language. We believe that coding is a great way to teach students valuable life skills. It's an endless process of trial and error to try to get the right code in the right place. It requires resilience and imperfection, and as students tinker with those kinds of challenges, they learn that it's okay to make mistakes and to embrace them as learning opportunities, which helps them remain brave and resilient in the future no matter what they're doing. And as technology continues to shape the way that we live, computing skills have become some of the most sought after skills in the US economy. In fact, computing jobs are growing at three times the rate of overall job creation right now. And although we may think that these jobs are concentrated in tech fields within the Silicon Valley, the truth is that 91% of these jobs are located in other places around the country, and two thirds of them are in non-tech fields. So think art, medicine, agriculture, education, manufacturing, and much more. Not only are these opportunities abundant, but also careers in computer science offer an average salary of $100,000 annually, which is double the average U.S. salary right now. And today alone, there are 500,000 open computing jobs in the United States, but just about 85,000 graduates in computer and informational sciences in 2019 to fill them. So there's a tremendous gap between open roles and qualified individuals to fill those roles. Less than one in five computer scientists are women right now, and an even smaller number are women of color. And this is reflected exactly in current AP computer science examination breakdowns with only about 26% of CSAP exams being taken by girls. This gender gap in technology has continued to widen over the past few decades rather than shrink, and that has become a huge problem for two major reasons. One, when women and non-binary folks are pushed out of this space, they lose out on these high paying jobs. And two, we lose out as a society when these companies create new products or programs or other organizations building products and programs as well that don't include diverse perspectives from all walks of life. 
If our young women are given the chance to develop world-leading computing skills and apply them at U.S. companies, then we'll be at the center of a thriving new digital economy. And most importantly, tripling the number of women working in computing would significantly reduce the skills shortages in American businesses and organizations. And that is where Girls Who Code comes in. We are an international nonprofit leading the movement to closing the gender gap in technology and changing the image of what a programmer looks like and does. We do this by providing completely free computer science programs to students to help them prepare for their careers. And the possibilities of how we use technology are truly endless. As I mentioned earlier, two thirds of computing jobs are in non-traditional tech fields like medicine, entertainment, education, business, and much, much more. At Girls Who Code, we challenge you to use technology to get creative and to dream big. You can see some of the unique ways we've used technology here, from creating a visual album with Lizzo for International Day of the Girl, to a more recent collaboration with Doja Cat, which has the world's first codable music video collaborated with her. And once students join Girls Who Code through any of our free programs, they become part of our sisterhood and are supported by us for life. Our main program and focus today will be our free clubs program, which provides curricula, resources, and support for third to 12th grade students and their communities. But we also have summer immersion programs to discuss and our summer self-paced program. Um, our summer immersion program is a two-week virtual program for ninth through 11th grade girls and non-binary students to learn an introduction to computer science and get an inside look at the tech industry through our company partners. We also released a downloadable standalone coding activity called Code at Home that you can access directly from our website, and anybody, a student or not, is welcome to use that. And once students in our clubs or summer programs participate, they'll get to tap into all of our exclusive alumni benefits, which include a webinar series and newsletters offering hiring tips and strategies. We have college loops programming. We also have a hiring summit to connect recent college graduates with potential employers and technical interview prep courses. But for today's purposes, we will mostly focus on clubs programs. And as a reminder, Girls Who Code clubs are a way for individuals and community members to bring Girls Who Code resources, curriculum, and activities into their own communities to start a club. Summer programs are programming that are run completely in-house by Girls Who Code. But before uh, we dive right into how to get started with clubs programs um, and all the ways that our clubs programming can be used um, and integrated, I wanna make sure we touch upon our summer opportunities because technically the deadline is tonight. Our summer immersion program, as I mentioned before, is a two-week program in which students will work on personal and collaborative projects while also participating in exclusive virtual events with our company partners like MetLife, Bank of America, Accenture, and many, many more. You'll get an exclusive look at the tech field by hearing from guest speakers, participating in workshops, and connecting with inspiring female and non-binary engineers and entrepreneurs in the tech space right now. The Summer Immersion Program is designed for current 9th through 11th grade girls and non-binary students who are beginner and intermediate level coders, and we're excited to announce that we are offering curriculum in game design this year. This is our first year doing that. They'll code in p5.js, which is the JavaScript library for creative coding. In week one, they'll learn elements of game design and the iterative design process to build a series of short games. And then in week two, they'll use the skills they learned in week one to create a game for good, where they'll design a game to address a change they hope to see in the world. And the summer immersion program is full of some really awesome benefits. Firstly, we have a $300 SIP student grant and tech supports for all students who qualify. So if they don't have Wi-Fi or the right tech at home, we will happily hook them up as well. We also have a teaching team that's there to support and encourage them through coding adventures all through the summer. And then we also have mentoring opportunities and exclusive virtual events with those company partners. So MetLife, Bank of America, Accenture, and all of those computer scientists and representatives will be there over the course of those two weeks. And then there is a lifetime of Girls Who Code community with our alumni network, which I mentioned earlier. So we have lots of college and career support for them afterwards. We also have our self-paced program, which is a six-week program in which students will be able to learn to code on their own schedule through independent study and real-world projects. The self-paced program is designed for current ninth to 12th grade girls and non-binary students, meaning that if they're seniors in high school who are about to graduate, they can participate in this program. This program is also for students who are beginner and intermediate level coders, and students must already have computer and internet access at the ready to participate in the self-paced program. There are three tracks available to choose from. 
web development in HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, or cybersecurity, and our brand new data science track in Python. Each track contains two to three courses, um, and they take about three to six hours to complete by the project. Students in web development can take portfolio websites, personality quizzes, and advocacy website courses. The cybersecurity track offers the cybersecurity chatbot course and the decrypt the secret message courses. And lastly, in our new data science track, we're offering courses in data analysis and its connection to social justice. For each completed course in the self-paced program, students will earn a certificate that can be added to their resume and posted on social media in addition to the portfolio of creations they make. And plus, they'll have the option to join weekly live advisor sessions to ask questions, to build community with other self-paced programs, uh, students, and to meet each other in a live setting. There are also some really unique benefits to the self-paced program. So they'll have the ability to choose from three different tracks, learn different coding languages, and earn certificates for each course they complete. They'll get to build community and sisterhood through those weekly connections and other program participants through those times. Weekly sessions with mentors will also be available who can support them not just throughout the summer, but also throughout their career. And just like summer immersion, self-paced students also gain lifetime access to Girls Who Code's community with our alumni network and college and career support. And as a note, self-paced students need to complete at least one course and earn one certificate to access the self-paced program alumni benefits, but they don't need to complete all three, although we know we'll have some ambitious students this summer who do. And now that we've discussed summer programs, and I do actually want to pause here and let everybody know that our deadline is tonight um, at midnight Eastern time. However, we have a very robust waitlist, um, and we intend to pull students off of that waitlist really every day, every week as classrooms continue to open up. It is not a stagnant waitlist. It's a very active and optimistic one. So even so, I strongly encourage you to have any students who might be interested to apply. We constantly pull students off of our waitlist on an annual basis with the idea in mind that we will continue to open up classrooms as we see need. So the application takes about 10 minutes. It does not require GPA or any form of teacher recommendations. It is very, very quick. So strongly encourage if you have any high schoolers in your life who might be interested, they can throw their hat in the ring now. Um, if they can't tonight, there is a wait list that is very open and we would love to see if we can um, take a peek at their application in advance of summer programs starting and to see how many students we can bring into our classrooms. Uh, so yeah, we hope we'll bring that to them and see if they can join us. Um, but now that I've covered summer programming a little bit, I wanna make sure we also dive into clubs. Our clubs program is a free program for third to 12th grade students to join our sisterhood of supportive peers and role models and to use computer science to change the world. We believe all girls and gender non-conforming students have the ability to change the world through code and we aim to serve them all, especially those who are underrepresented in computer science in terms of race, creed, background, free or reduced lunch eligibility, or students have little to no access or exposure to computer science education, and those who identify as female regardless of gender assignment at birth or legal recognition. I'll also note that for our clubs program, students of all genders are welcome, so you are welcome to invite your boy students as well. I always think it's great for girls, boys, and students of any gender to know that there are inspiring women in tech and that they too can be an advocate for gender equity and all forms of equity wherever they go. And they rep the t-shirts with just as much pride, I should note. And we have three central pillars that underpin our educational philosophy. Firstly, by emphasizing more than code, we're not just teaching students to program. We're teaching them computational thinking. And that's how to break down problems and to think creatively, which are helpful skills to have in any profession. We're also empowering our students to be brave and take risks, building their resiliency to tackle any challenge they may face. Through sisterhood, we let students know that they belong. Research has shown that having a supportive group to learn and grow with can help with retention. We have students feeling supported through an emphasis on community and diverse representation in our curriculum. And once students join our supportive and diverse sisterhood, they are members for life, as I've mentioned before. And they can always lean on Girls Who Code for anything, from questions about applying to college to finding a connection at their dream job. And finally, by prioritizing real world relevance and impact, we show students that they can use computer science to change the world. And we empower them to use their computer science skills, no matter what they want to accomplish, to do just that. 
And in order to cater to the unique learning needs and styles of students in different age groups, we've divided our clubs program into third to fifth grade clubs and sixth to 12th grade clubs. The third to fifth grade program follows a book club model that teaches beginner level concepts with the option of being online or completely unplugged. Typically across the country, and this is totally just an average and norms vary very distinctly between clubs, so I should note that as well, but these meetings usually run for about five or more sessions at about 45 to 60 minutes per session, but there's also the option to shorten that time to about 20 minutes synchronously if you choose our hybrid option. Meanwhile, our 6th to 12th grade program teaches computer science concepts of all skill levels um, and through flexible curricula with self-guided tutorials. This program usually runs for a minimum of 10 one to two hour sessions, and again, that's kind of a national average and can run for many different ways. Um, with most clubs running for a full semester, a year or year after year. And for hybrid options, there's the option to do about 30 to 40 minutes synchronously with students and then assign the rest of your club members to work independently. Most importantly, our club's program is designed so that anybody can start a club, and there is no computer science experience necessary from students or facilitators. In addition to showing that anyone, regardless of computer science experience, can start in league clubs, our goal is to minimize prep time by providing flexible club meeting guides that make it very easy for facilitators and staff to just take that curriculum and run with it. For our third to fifth grade clubs, each club meeting consists of about three main chunks with an optional opportunity to do a community building sisterhood activity to start that meeting off. The reading is broken up with chapter guides and activities that encourage students to be brave and resilient as they learn about computer science concepts. And we have coding challenges that can be done on a computer using Scratch or totally offline. Each meeting ends with a stand up, which is an opportunity for reflection and feedback to begin nurturing a growth mindset. And you'll notice that our 6th to 12th grade curriculum is made up of very similar components and also starts off with a sisterhood activity. In our Women in Tech Spotlights, club members explore bravery, resilience, creativity, and purpose through real-life examples of computer scientists and women using computer science skills in a variety of fields. And then afterwards, club members work through a Girls Who Code project, and these tutorials to create these Girls Who Code projects are very important. They hone their skills for coding, and they use programming languages like Scratch, Python, or Swift from Apple, um, as well as being compatible and integrated with other coding programs and languages to use our projects alongside. And similar to the third to fifth grade curriculum, each sixth to twelfth grade meeting also ends with a stand up. Each of these components can be run totally in person or totally virtually, and we offer the flexibility to run portions of your meeting synchronously as a group and then asynchronously outside of your club's meeting time as well. And to start a club, all you need is space in a nonprofit to host that club, like a school or a library or a community center, or has the capacity to host your club virtually through Google Classroom, Zoom, or any other virtual conferencing platform. Technology and internet connection are required for each club member of 6th to 12th grade clubs, but are optional for 3rd to 5th grade clubs. Our curriculum is compatible with PCs, Macs, and Chromebooks, and iPads are also an option, but they can really only be used for our beginner self-guided tutorials in the coding language Swift. So if you intend for your curriculum to extend beyond that, we recommend avoiding iPads at the outset. Lastly, there are two roles that every club needs. We have facilitators and decision makers. The facilitator is a volunteer who guides club members through the curriculum. They have to be 18 years or older and pass a background check if they're not an employee of the club host site. Employees of host sites, like teachers at schools or librarians at libraries, are not required to go through a separate background check. Most importantly, facilitators need no computer science or technical experience to facilitate a club due to the resources and the support we provide. We will happily teach you to code alongside your students. And then there's the decision maker, who is someone employed by the club host site who serves as the point of contact between Girls Who Code and the nonprofit host site location. These two roles can be the same person or they can be two different people. And once you have those three things, you are ready to apply and launch your club. We also support club logistics by providing lots of flexible club meeting guides and virtual facilitation resources, along with recruitment toolkits to help you recruit new club members or facilitators. We also offer tons of online training and tutorials to help you build your own computer science skills and confidence as a facilitator, whether you're hosting your club in person or virtually. So if you are ready to join us, here's how to do it. 
To access the club's application, you can head to girls who code forward slash clubs apply, which I will drop in the chat now, and make an account on girls who code HQ, which is our virtual learning platform and our one stop shop for everything girls who code. And then you can make sure you indicate you want to start a club during the application. And by creating an HQ login, you also get to preview all of the curriculum before you even apply to begin that club. And then you'll fill out a quick clubs application, which only takes about 10 minutes max. And after your application is approved within five to 10 business days, you can use your HQ login to access the full curriculum and everything you need to host that first session. You'll also receive a welcome email with your club code, which is a unique identifier your students will use to affiliate with your specific club. And then once you're ready, you can launch your club at any point during the school year. You'll help students access the curriculum by enrolling them on HQ using the club code you received in your approval email. And that's all there is to it. And I also want to note that while school years are the most typical time that clubs are run, we also have a tremendous and robust group of summer clubs all across the country. And we have programming that's specifically designed to help you do that, including a boot camp format. So that is also an option. And just like how we know that everybody can learn to code, we believe that developing holistic and equitable coding programs doesn't have to be hard. Girls Who Code has your back. Before we dive into how to get started with our programs, we'll discuss a couple of best practices for fostering inclusive programming. There are five elements of Girls Who Code clubs that you can incorporate into your programming to build community, encourage positive social emotional development, build a supportive network of peers and diverse role models for students, and connect coding to impact. Our Sisterhood Activities series will help students acknowledge their successes and strengths, reflect on progress, and build community. Our curriculum provides icebreaker activities with others focused on communication or teamwork and innovation. And this is one of my favorites. It's a sample entrepreneurship activity called Pitch a Product. So you'll put together either an in-person or a virtual cup of random adjectives and then a bunch of random nouns separately. You'll have each team or individual, depending on the size of your club, um, to choose one adjective and one noun to create a product name, like glitter coffee or bouncing pants or power potato. And each team will then have 10 minutes to come up with an imaginary product that they'd sell and their pitch and all of the details therein. So finally, each team or person will pitch that product to the club and everybody gets to degrade. So let's say that this team got glitter coffee, which is an example we so love to use. They might say something like, have you ever wanted to feel the power of a unicorn? Try glitter coffee. For only $5 a cup, you can get all the shiny caffeine you could ever wish for. And I'm sure with 10 minutes longer, our teams would have something much more robust than this, but you get the gist. And another unique component of our club's curriculum is providing youth with diverse representation in tech careers. At Girls Who Code, we believe you cannot be what you cannot see. And that's why it's so important to include representation of inspiring and diverse role models that reflect the experiences of your students. So you can include role models of all facets of identity, especially for underrepresented groups. And this might include diversity in discipline or field, ethnicity, gender, race, social class, religion, ability, age, orientation, and more. When choosing which role models to highlight, you can be mindful of including individuals across all of these lines of difference. And this helps your students see themselves reflected and encourages them to learn about other identities in a supportive and respectful way at the same time. And it's also important to deepen your discussions of these role models based on the life skills you hope to instill in your students. For each Girls Who Code text spotlight we highlight, club members find a role model, they'll read about them, and they'll watch a video and discuss questions related to bravery, resilience, creati resilience creativity, and purpose. And as mentioned earlier, we're looking to transform what students think programmers look like and what they do. Is anybody here familiar with coded bias? And that's usually because it's the, a data set that can have an overrepresentation of certain values, right? Well, if we only hear about one side of certain tech figures and only one set of examples that all kind of seem homogenous, we're likely to think there aren't as many diverse examples, which is just like algorithmic issues that we see today. So our Girls Who Code Tech Spotlights introduce students and us adults too with diversity into our data sets. And these are two of the many hundreds of spotlights that introduce role models in tech. Camille Stewart on the left works in cybersecurity, and Brian Lee on the right works in advertising at Instagram. 
So not only do these students learn about the work that these pioneers do, but they begin to imagine themselves exploring a lot of different career paths in places they, they might not have expected otherwise. And at Girls Who Code, we always say and strongly believe in the idea that it's hard to believe or hard to be what you can't see. And that's why it's so important to have representation of inspiring and diverse role models that reflect all of the experiences of your students. Here is one example of our tech spotlight, which is Maral Kotip, and her dream was to become a professional dancer, but she also loved to code. And as a student, these two professional paths seemed entirely separate to her. However, Maral did not settle for the status quo, as you can see in that gift we have over there. After working as a software engineer at Bloomberg, she realized that the two seemingly separate worlds of dance and code could come together to create something pretty magical. So she created Illuminate. In 2009, she founded Illuminate, which is a dance group that uses wireless lighting programs to create explosive and very colorful performances, and she serves as its CEO today. Since Illuminate's debut on America's Got Talent in 2011, that group has traveled across the world performing with the Black Eyed Peas and David Guetta, as well as starring in off-Broadway shows and The X Factor. So students would watch a video of Moral describing in her own words her experience combining computer science and dance, and then they would discuss how Moral and her work relates to the strengths of great computer scientists and how we can focus on building them all together. And here are just some of the questions that we would pose in a club format. You can decide as a facilitator which pieces you'd like to emphasize, um, but encouraging a variety of questions from your students and from yourself is always a great idea. And our focus on real world relevance and impact is embodied, especially in our six to 12th grade clubs through Girls Who Codes Project, which is a collection of work centering around a topic that club members care about. This leads us to our next component that is unique to our sixth grade, uh, six to 12th grade clubs. And our club's curriculum, coding tutorials and activity sets encourage club members to create Girls Who Codes projects. And these projects are centered around all different topics all around the country. Some are very prescient in students' lives and others are a little bit more abstract and asp aspirational. And the Girls Who Code project is essential to our pillar of relevance and impact. By asking students to use coding skills that they've learned in clubs to address a topic they select and are passionate about, the Girls Who Code project is the primary way that our 6th to 12th grade club students experience real-world hands-on learning where they see that they can make a difference with code. So whether it's addressing social justice issues like climate change, you can see a themed game for climate change on the top right, or raising mental health awareness, combating educational inequity or bullying, or emphasizing the importance of data security, club students find incredibly creative ways to make an impact by building websites, games, and apps, and much, much more. The sky is really the limit with what they create at this stage. And the last portion of a typical club session is called a stand-up. And stand-ups are a practice that real software developers use in their actual careers to keep other members of their teams up to date on what they're working on, what they might need help with soon or currently, and any accomplishments they've made thus far. Stand-ups let club members keep each other updated on progress of mutual projects or individual projects, any roadblocks they've encountered, and any accomplishments they've recently uh, made their way to. And it's a, a chance to get feedback, ask for help, and to celebrate. And you can see some of the prompts we have that we use in clubs listed here, but there are many more. And now that we've discussed a number of ways to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in coding programs, and more specifically how Girls Who Code's free clubs program provides that all-inclusive and readily accessible framework you can have access to to take these strategies back to your students and community, we also recommend that you make a lot of time for moments of celebration when teaching computer science. We're here to help with coding challenges, larger clubs activities, and an end of year club's graduation. We also have an ever-changing array of opportunities for students to connect, engage, and take pride in their accomplishments. So in addition to celebrating wins and successes, help students build resilience by celebrating their mistakes too as learning opportunities. And our founder, Reshma Sajani, actually always believed in teaching students specifically to be brave and not perfect. This resilience is key to persisting in tech fields in the future. And thereby, it's very important to celebrate successes throughout the year during each club meeting through stand-ups and reflections and activities, but also don't forget to celebrate those failures. 
girls are especially socialized to be perfect and to shy away from their failures, but it can really help your students build resilience by celebrating those mistakes. Our founder even started hashtag failure Friday on her Instagram as a way to celebrate one way she failed that week and what she learned. So encourage your students to celebrate those successes alongside their failures to begin building a growth mindset. And that is an example of our clubs challenge that we did this fall. We typically have a couple of those. We also encourage our clubs to provide opportunities for students to connect. And some ways you can build connection, care, and empathy is to create a collective mascot to care for. Scratch is one of the coding languages that we focus on, and they have a logo that's called Scratchy the Cat. And one of our clubs has a Scratch project where each week a new club member would choose a different location, outfit, and saying for scratching. And that can be a really one, uh, fun way for folks to show off their skills and also different ways to introduce who they are to their group. You can also build a buddy system where each month you pair up your club members so they can get to know each other further and have accountability for coming to club meetings as well, which is very helpful. And lastly, it's always great to modify your day's activities based on a pulse check of how your club members are feeling. If you Google on a scale of feelings or blob tree, you'll see great images like the ones I have down here, which provide a really low touch and less direct way for you to get a quick pulse check of the room. And in addition to classroom agreements, you can create leadership opportunities to help your students feel even more engaged and included, as well as build essential leadership skills and responsibility. At Girls Who Code, our clubs outline out five optional roles that you'll see here, but you're welcome to be creative and to create ones as club needs pop up. We have a technology officer who assists the facilitator with routine maintenance of computers, tablets, phones, and other devices necessary for implementation of club curriculum. We also have the coding coach who supports the facilitator with implementation of coding activities provided in the curriculum, and they'll offer assistance to beginner level club members as well. We have the social media chair, which is also known to some clubs as the hype person, who helps the facilitator with regular documentation of the club's activities, including taking photos, maintaining a blog or a vlog, depending on your capacity, and other digital hubs to showcase club activities. We also have the project lead who assists the facilitator with timely completion of cumulative projects during club cycles to support meeting deadlines, submitting the project to the project gallery, and other club goals that are decided beforehand. And finally, the supplies monitor helps the facilitator with keeping track of all the club's practical needs, like working devices, school supplies, and the ever important snacks. So you can find what works well for your students, and you can make space for them to grow as young leaders in any of these positions. We also often will recommend that you switch roles throughout the year to give students opportunities to grow in leadership skills in a variety of areas and ensure visibility and representation of all the students in your community. And these are just some of the questions that you can ask as you consider how to implement all of our programming or any other form of computer science programming you're seeking to make more inclusive and equity focused. And now that we've discussed some of the ways that you can foster inclusivity in coding program and what we do specifically at Girls Who Code, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to access more resources from Girls Who Code that you can bring straight to your community. So we create customized, thoughtful partnerships with state and local leaders, school districts, community organizations, libraries, and after-school networks, and colleges and universities to provide students access to our free curriculum and our summer immersion program. Together, we will happily help you meet your STEM goals in your organization, provide additional professional development opportunities for your staff, and even give additional free Girls Who Code swag to all of those in your network that participate. Our partnership means that every facilitator in your network is part of an even larger Girls Who Code support system. So everybody who's running a club gets to know each other and exist under that umbrella. And as you can see from the quote from one of our community partners on the right, forming a partnership led to a large expansion of Girls Who Code clubs across that school district. And I must say, because I see a familiar face with one of our amazing Northeastern partnerships, hi Kim. Um, uh, just pointing that out, we have some really amazing relationships and we have seen such wonderful ways to build connection all across states, different organizations, um, and it's really a wonderful opportunity to join us and it's truly what you make it. We have a lot of different opportunities to support you that way. Oh, 
one too far. At Girls Who Code, we are dedicated to creating partnerships that best suit your specific organization as well. And that's why we have two types of community partners. We have host partners and connector partners. So if your organization directly supports potential club host sites, like school districts or library networks or large community center networks, you can become a host partner to launch clubs at those multiple locations in your network and spread the word about our summer immersion program to students who qualify that are underneath that umbrella. But if you don't have direct access to potential club host sites, if you're a STEM hub or a larger after school network with no physical home bases, you can become something that's called a connector partner by spreading the word about clubs and our summer program to your community through newsletters, webinars, events, and other ways that we can connect with you. And as a community partner, you get access to a long list of additional benefits to support your network. And these are totally a la carte as well. So it's fully dependent on what works specifically for your community and your organization. We provide year-round support from dedicated Girls Who Code community partner managers. We also have community partner programs, dashboards, and toolkits to support and track your specific community's engagement across your network. We also have monthly updates in our community partner newsletter and exclusive invitations to our quarterly community partner webinars. We want to connect you with other community partners that are both local to you and nationwide so you have the chance to share resources and hear from each other. We also have facilitator recruitment webinars and professional development opportunities for your community that are hosted by your community partner managers and priority access to special events, additional support, incentives, and more for all affiliated clubs. We also have exclusive opportunities to earn extra Girls Who Code swag for affiliated clubs, which students tend to love. And we also have priority consideration for all of our 2023 summer immersion program student applicants. So we will elevate their priority to keep them in community within partnership and also throughout the summer. And that's all there is to it. If you have any questions about any element of our programming, please do not hesitate to email me, but I'm about to open the floor for questions and look at our chat real quick. Oh, thank you, Kim. Yes, Kim is a representative from one of our most fabulous partnerships, if I do say so myself. Um, she does amazing work with a ton of libraries and community groups. It is just such a fabulous experience for, I hope, the both of us. Oh, and there is one for Vermont. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, we have such wonderful and extensive partnerships all throughout the Northeast um, from a lot of different organizations. Thank you, Laura. Is there a way for cohort of librarians to do modules together in advance of offering this program for young people? Absolutely. Um, because our programming is all online and on one platform, you are welcome to gather with folks who are interested in using our curriculum. In fact, I think that's a great way to build community among each other, and thereby you can continue to knowledge share, find techniques that work for your specific students, um, and just continue to troubleshoot together as you build out clubs or any form of programming that you would like to have in a mutual um, conversation with them. So that's wonderful. How much is it to start a club in a rural library? Um, from Girls Who Code side of things, it is completely free. If you have any roadblocks from a funding perspective or a tech access perspective, please contact us directly. While we don't provide anything specifically from a grant perspective, we try to get really creative with how we're able to bring our programming to folks, and we will do everything in our power to make sure that you're able to start a club or to join us in partnership as much as possible. So please don't consider that roadblock an immediate close of the door from working with us. We'll try to find ways to work with you. Oh, Caroline, yep, running a club is totally free. Partnerships are totally free. Any way that you work with us from a community building perspective, any club, totally completely free. We never charge for anything. I know you said boys can join, says Christine, but is there ever any pushback about the name and them not feeling uh, like or understanding that they can? Well, we definitely have a, a name that is very specific and gender and gender specific. Um, however, we definitely have lots of clubs that are called Coding Club powered by Girls Who Code. That's an option. You're welcome to modify the name of your club to make it a little bit more boy and non-binary inclusive if you would like. And especially if you have a lot of students who've demonstrated interest but might feel as though that might not be a space that they're welcome into, that's totally fine. However, most typically the boys are great. They have a great time. And again, they rep those t-shirts with just as much pride. Um, we have boys who come up to our 
fair booths and ask for stickers. We think it's a great opportunity for them to see an environment by which girls are centered and elevated, especially in an industry that they're really, really not right now, especially from a professional standpoint. And we do anticipate boys eventually becoming computer scientists too, and we want them to enter a world where they see that equity. So please invite your boys, have them join, um, have them learn alongside your girls. Well, thank you, Kim, for adding your own experience. You've had people change the name but use the curriculum that they feel works best for their community. That is the exact answer. We see that across the board nationwide. Wonderful, Lisa. Thank you so much for giving that example of what you've seen with your own club. That is fabulous. Thank you. That is awesome. 15 weeks. That is definitely, again, I, I mentioned how loose our guidelines are and they're designed to be fully flexible. So 15 weeks is a great length of time for a program to run. Semesters and school years tend to be really nice demarcators for folks who might be just starting out. And it can kind of integrate right into the hum and swing of what classrooms are already like and school year cadences are already like. But we also see huge variation in that. So feel free to try what works for you and to pilot something and then tweak it as you go. Do we provide hardware? Um, unfortunately, we don't directly provide the hardware. We provide everything around it. However, if you're having trouble having access to tech, please, please, again, I emphasize contacting us directly. Again, we don't provide direct grants, but we want to find ways to work with you. We want to get creative and we want to reach into our networks to see exactly how much we can provide as possible. So again, this is definitely something we'd like to address. Thank you, Amy. Yes, Chromebooks are a very common option. We so recommend them. We tend to have, those tend to be very um, prolific through schools and libraries, and they tend to be compatible with a lot of our coding languages. So feel free to use Chromebooks all the way through. Oh, the bit.ly link. Kim, thank you. Oh my goodness. Kim, you are so the all-star of this chat. Thank you. Truly like a huge shout out to Kim for answering tons of questions. She truly is like the unsung expert on this um, in this uh, conference right now um, for all things Girls Who Code. Um, I'm tremendously grateful uh, to all of your help and all of these fabulous questions too. I will pause here and now just if there are any further questions. Oh, and I will also just include our our QR code, and I will place my email in the chat for anybody who has any direct questions or any specific questions that are relevant to their communities. I would be happy to answer them or to take some time for a call too, so you can request that. I'm also going to take a second to jump in here. I don't know if anyone is in this particular room from Connecticut, but Michaela is going to be at CLA in May. So um, for folks to go and meet her in person and, and ask any questions about Girls Who Code, um, she's going to be joining us at the Mystic Marriott this year. So um, y'all can drop by and say hi. I will be. Please, yes, stop by. We are so excited to be joining you there. Um, we'll have swag and some fun stuff, some extra flyers. Um, I'm happy to troubleshoot with you right on site of any questions that you might have. Um, yes, please use me as a resource, especially if you're coming, or at least just come and say hi. Both days? Yes, both days. I will be there. Yeah, I will pause here. Oh, more chat questions. Also feel free to come off of mute if you'd like. If you have a more specific question or you just don't feel like typing it out, feel free. Um, hi, I'm Tracy. I'm from Vermont. Um, so I was just wondering about the flow of um, one of the programs, maybe for teens or um, maybe younger for tweens. Is it like an introduction, for example, to HTML and then moving into PHP? Um, or how like how is the how does the flow work for the coding classes? Absolutely. Um, so for our summer programs, those will run on a, a teacher focused cadence. So that'll totally be done in house. That's not something that any facilitator will have to be concerned with. 
Regarding introductory uh, coding experiences, you are welcome to use any and all of our programming as it's delineated, but it's also plug and play. So if you'd like to slow down with what you teach, you're welcome to pull things out, put new things in. Um, but it does start from bedrock, so beginners are welcome. Um, and we work with a number of coding languages. I should also note how flexible our curriculum really is. It's always hard to per specifically convey exactly how how much it can be um, integrated into other forms of programming. We have girls who code in AP computer science classes where they're using our projects to work with very advanced coding languages um, with older high school students who are preparing to build portfolios for college, say. That's one place that you can find our programming. But you can also find it in a third grade classroom where students are just learning what computer science and coding and programming are. And that's awesome. So we really offer a wide range. You can start off immediately, especially with students who are middle school and up, sixth grade and up. They can immediately jump into coding languages on the first day if you wanted to. And you'll have access to moving our programming around. But it's truly at the pace of your students. It's at your comfort level or the facilitator's comfort level more specifically. Um, but a wide range of, of introductions to different languages are fully open and optional. For um, I'm just curious, like for librarians, um, like when I was cataloging, I would often associate like people would ask about MARC records and I would sort of say like MARC records are the HTML of like your catalog and like or they're the birth certificate of the book and explain it like in a way I'm wondering if we can like how much um, leeway we would have with like introducing other um, forms of code that aren't necessarily in you know the programming languages but but mark records and stuff like that that are more related to libraries that's a great question my apologies i clicked on kim's link and had it playing briefly i hope i hope folks can hear me again although i strongly <laughs> recommend i'm sorry we didn't hear anything. I'm so sorry. I'm just no, not at all. I was thrilled that you placed that there. That is an excellent example of how it can integrate. But I think that that's totally an option um, that you can use, Tracy. Um, yes. And my apologies for for jumping off of that screen briefly. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're welcome to use HTML. While we don't specifically emphasize HTML or really any specific coding language, while we do have examples that can be used that are automatically plugged into the curriculum, if you wanted to focus on HTML, I see no reason or any conflict with what we already have in our curriculum. Um, I also see another question. If one person is running the clubs, Sarah, would it be difficult for you to run a third to fifth and sixth to 12th grade club concurrently? I actually have one clarifying question for you. Do you mean at the same time, Sarah? Like, like uh, let's say you started uh, at 3 p.m. on Tuesdays for both of those clubs. That could be a little challenging, I would note. Um, however, if you're running a club from like your third to fifth graders um, one day of the week and then your sixth to 12th oh, during the same academic period, fabulous. So yeah, we have lots and lots of facilitators who do that because they have that wide range of students and they'd like to offer both. It's certainly by no means required that you do both. Um, and if you wanted to pilot with just one, especially depending on your comfort with coding already, that might be a nice way. You could start with your third to fifth graders and then maybe integrated sixth to 12th grade club in the next semester or the next cycle that you have. Um, but if you'd like to jump in with two, that is fabulous. Um, and it's truly at your bandwidth. What is a good size for a library club group? Kim, I'll let you jump in here, but typically and on average, I would say that clubs across the country function really well between 10 and 20 students, though we have clubs that reach up to 30. Typically at 30, we recommend that folks either split the clubs up on different days or with two different facilitators just because it can get a little bit crowded. Um, but otherwise, 15 tends to be a really, 10 to 15 is a really great sweet spot. But I'm going to hand the mic back over to you, Kim, because I definitely think you would know exactly how your libraries have worked best. I always wonder why I'm dropping all these links. Not, not only am I sort of the facilitator in Connecticut, but I ran a Girls Who Code Club when I worked frontline. So I, I, I know what the back end looks like. And one of the things that I, I want to suggest, if anyone's thinking about doing a club, you can sign up so that you can look at the curriculum in advance and figure out the best way to make it work so that you're comfortable and your students are comfortable. 
But yeah, I think what Michaela said, like a 10 to 20 uh, group would be fine. One of the things that I did, I saw that um, there were folks who were concerned about, um, you know, having enough hardware and things is we use the buddy system and we put two kids with one computer to have them sort of co-design projects. And that worked really well for me when I was doing it in person. This is obviously like pre-pandemic. So, you know, like take, take mental stock of your community and sort of their comfort level and where everyone is with that. If you're running something in person, you know, are our kids going to be okay using the same laptop? But um, it was really helpful with regards to, um, collaboration and working together. Um, we had no problems with it in the community that I, I worked in. And, um, you know, my librarians here in Connecticut run the programs at public libraries, at school libraries. Um, and it's really great because you just like get all the curriculum. Like it is, you, you get everything and you just, you just follow the outline. Like it really couldn't be easier. I don't know anything about coding aside from what I learned when I had MySpace and I've forgotten most of that. Uh, so um, I, yeah, I really like this, this program, Girls Who Code, which is why I talk about it a lot and I've dropped 19,000 links, I'm sorry. Kim's being very modest with her skill set here. And I still don't believe it. <laughs> Give it my my idea of coding is making a knitting pattern or a weaving draft work, so. Oh my gosh. Don't, don't get me started. Wait, where's my crochet? It's all here. Like, listen, like it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> but the video that I dropped was we do a program in Connecticut called CT Pages where we give um, librarians an opportunity to just sort of share interesting programs that they're doing. And the video link that I dropped is from the Pomfret Public Library. And they were, they did Girls Who Code that one summer where we were like, is it over? Um, so because they wanted to remain cognizant of social distancing, social distancing, they integrated a lot of the outdoors, like they went hiking, um, and did a lot of really great things. So it doesn't, you're also not just sort of limited to being directly in front of the computer. Um, we can sort of put our librarian hats on and, and find other ways to integrate, um, programming into the, um, the, old, the overall girls who code curriculum also. So I I say, what's the worst that could happen? The kids teach you instead of you teach them. And then at the end of the day, really everybody's one. Kim, I so love that. And I say that truly all the time uh, that some of the best clubs with the best communities we ever see are from folks who as facilitators did not know a lot about coding. I have a tremendous bias towards them. I think there's something really special about having your students learn alongside you. And very often they tend to surpass all of us in some way or another, and they will teach us all that we need to know as well. Um, so really generating that excitement, that community. Yes, love being an old millennial. Um, that is I think that is perfectly emblematic. I hope that you can all revel in what your students will teach you, either through Girls Who Code or through other programming. It's a really wonderful way for students to have that kind of agency, to get to teach you. It's a really special time. Um, Laura, you said students who receive special services, not sure which level. Um, I'm wondering if you're asking about accessibility. I think that that would definitely be a case by case basis for the facilitator and the group of students. But if you are comfortable educating them, I am very, very sure that you'll be comfortable educating them using our programming, knowing where their strengths lie, what they're up to and what they're comfortable learning, uh, learning at this time. Uh, I'm going to jump in and I might be able to help. Um, we do a series in Connecticut called GELS. It stands for Growing Equitable Library Services. And not too long ago, I'm looking at my other screen, um, we did a workshop series full of scenarios where we, where we brought in um, people who work in different ADA fields within Connecticut. We called it um, ADA and Beyond Making Programs Accessible for All. And one of the scenarios that we actually gave was Girl to Code specifically. So the professional um, who uh, from, from our state gave like very specific examples of ways that you could make a coding program accessible for people with different needs. Um, so I'll drop that link in as well. And folks can sort of watch it. And there's lots of, I'm just going to drop the whole page in there, quite frankly, because I don't feel like opening the YouTube. Um, 
but uh, there are some resources there that might might help folks and our presenters um, who also have a multitude of different accessibility needs are very open to people reaching out to them. I think whether you're in Connecticut or not. So um, making programs accessible for all, feel free to, to go in and, and poke through that because they did talk about coding. Kim, you truly have everything. Um, it is so helpful. Um, and again, I think that this is just so demonstrable of the amazing resources that don't just come from our side of things, but come from the amazing and tremendous community that exists within our programming. Kim is a shining example of that, um, as is Jonathan. We have had just such wonderful experiences getting everybody together to crowdsource these resources that can be used beyond Girls Who Code Clubs as well. Diane, it's so exciting to hear that you have the confidence. Please please give it a shot if you've been hesitant regarding your knowledge. This is a great, there's never a better time to learn than now, but especially once you feel like you can jump in regardless of your knowledge level at this time, we hope to grow with you. Yes, please, Tracy, give it a try. Um, any coding program, we hope to support you. We hope to integrate with your programs. That is such a wonderful way for us to start with folks. Um, and we hope to provide you lots of resources that you otherwise might not have access to. Um, but yes, I hope to see a lot of you in Connecticut in a month um, or a month or so. Um, yes, excited so truly uh, to get to meet all of you. Um, please feel free at any time to reach out to me. My email is in the chat. Um, and don't hesitate. No question is too small. We want to find ways to collaborate with you all where you and your students and your communities are at. Um, but so grateful for everybody's time. And I will hand the mic back over because I know that at 11, um, you have another presentation coming up. Thank you so much. And I was just going to say too, um, I'll, I'll put the Vermont link in the chat again. Um, so if you are you can list the Department of Libraries as your the community partner, um, and there's instructions on the page for that. Um, and if you have questions, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Michaela. Um, and uh, if you're just getting started or if you have done a program in the past and you want to revive it, um, we'll help however we can.